You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. Yeah, here we go. We've got Liz Ross here from Shift Paradigm. Welcome, Liz. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here with you today. Yeah, I can't wait to to get into some of this with you. Because, so you've been with Shift Paradigm as the CEO for uh, coming up on a year soon, right? Your anniversary? It's January 1st will be my uh, the conclusion oh, wow. of my first year. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Yeah, I'm sure. So we'll definitely want to get into the challenges you faced coming into an existing company, especially as it relates to culture. Um, but before we go into there, uh, we, we ask this, the our favorite question, our favorite question. We ask every guest, uh, the, the same first question, uh, which is what is a mistake that you've made in leadership that you'll never forget? Yeah. Uh, this question actually leads me to many, um, because I think leaders who have, I've been doing this for a long time, often have lots of mistakes to which they <laughs> point. Um, I am no exception. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I, I think my biggest mistake has been um, that I assume people know where what I'm thinking. And by that, I mean, if I've said something or I've um, mm -hmm. laid out a path, um, oftentimes, different people need different levels of repetition and clarity in order to know that. And I often, when I look back at, at mistakes I've made, it is almost always when, you know, the team has not yet onboarded what I've said, and I've moved forward thinking that everybody's in lockstep. Mm. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Uh, do, do you follow or have you read the author, Brene Brown? Yep, of course. So she talks about painting done and, uh, we'll get into the, the psychometric analysis that you took, the assessment you took, uh, where you came back as a maverick. Uh, we'll get into that later, but we're also both mavericks. And one of the things that <laughs> are hardwiring is we're visionary. We're like, you know, 30,000 foot view. And so we have a vision we've talked about it. So we assume everybody just gets it, uh, but they don't, uh, and, and painting done is hard. Yeah. It a hundred percent. And it's, it's not where sort of my heart lives, right? Mm -hmm. is, is being able to keep repainting or to sort of, so sort of once I've sort of seen a path forward, my instinct sort of at a cellular level is let's go. Let's and, go. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Yeah, 100 miles an hour, all gas, no brakes. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I feel you there. So, what are some coping mechanisms that you've come up with in your role in leadership? Yeah, so most importantly, it has really been a acknowledging that about myself and surrounding myself with people that are not like that. Um, yeah. People to make up for your gaps. Yeah, 100%. I mean, in, in this role, I've been lucky enough uh, to bring on a woman as my chief of staff, and it's been life changing. Like, I will not take a role ever that doesn't have that because yeah. it's, so much different than, for example, an exec admin, which is a nice thing, certainly to have, and, and there's value, but to have a, a chief of staff who really sorts through, who's, she's highly organized, she's very structured, very process driven, mm. has been beautiful, beautiful. Now, yeah. was, was this someone that you chose yourself since you've been here at Shift Paradigm? Okay. That's right. And, yeah. and so. Yeah. What was the process that you went through to make sure you had the right person? And how, how did you go through that sorting process? I'm curious to know. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think the role is so sort of intimate to, to mine that um, it was somebody I have worked with before, actually. Okay. Two different oh, nice. companies. Um, okay, but nice. I hadn't worked in this construct before. Like she had okay. been on teams in the organizations that I'd run, but I really looked at her and said, okay, like, let's figure this out. So you handpicked her. I did. Yeah. That's I great. Did. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, love that first question. We haven't even gotten into the intro, but that's part of the beauty of it. So for our watchers, listeners, uh, you know, Liz has 25, 26 years of experience, marketing leadership. You worked with massive brands, uh, 
your GM and HP and uh, I mean the list goes on and on and on. I, I, ha- I had it here. Um, well, and even the Delta various boards you sit on and yeah. your uh, philanthropic efforts that we see. Um, very very well rounded and and I love even well um, the one of the most recent uh, posts that you did on LinkedIn talking about kind of the the women's network that you're involved in and chief is that right that's right um, yeah I, I love seeing that because it's it's a we're gonna I'm gonna bring everyone up I'm going to to use the years of experience to develop others and to build into others and network and and those things are important but the kind of the mentorship aspect of it is to me I mean it's kind of I'm yeah. going to continue this. I'm going to help others be able to, to uh, come behind me and do what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, I really, um, you know, I would say largely my path um, is a little unconventional, right? Because I worked for a long time. I didn't have kids until I was in my 40s. I had my son yeah, I saw at that. 41 and I had twins at 44. Yeah. And, oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> those, were, those were interesting days. Um, I don't remember them, so that's helpful, but um, (laughs) that first year at all. But I think the the premise of sort of, you know, and women fall into this, but but certainly men do too, of sort of, can you have it all? And the truth is, yes, and it it often is a question of of timing and focus on priority. And I think um, Chief is a great example of, ways in which women are building new kinds of networks. Um, But I will tell you, I also never wanted to be known as a female CEO, right? Like just a CEO, just just a CEO. And I hope that I'm the best one for the job. And so um, I also counsel women all the time, like don't fall into a trap where someone else should tell you how much you should make or that you're, you're leaning on that. Because you want to be great, just be great, yeah. and that's the real opportunity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, we talk about work culture, but that's a topic that's culture at large. Uh, is is just the the struggle you have as a woman working your way up to the top and just navigating this world of what you deserve and you know what you should be paid and all that. You already mentioned Brene as well. I'll just bring her back to it. When I uh, I got to meet her in 2019, spent a few days getting trained. And she talked about like a huge pivotal point for her when um, one of the uh, male speakers at a convention was like, hey, girl, uh, you're headlining this thing and they're paying me three times what they're paying you. Mm -hmm. Don't ever do that again. (laughs) She was just like, oh, wow. Yeah. So she more than tripled her rate immediately and lost to zero gigs. (laughs) That's right. Because she's Renee. And I will say that I think... You know, I, I talk about this all the time in terms of sort of this this gender pay gap, and I haven't seen it in my career for whether it's just my ability to negotiate or my own naivete or bullheadedness. We could be either <laughs> one. But really this, I never wanted to make what a man made. I just wanted to make more. Sure. So I think that sort of headline for women in general is don't look sideways. Don't look sideways. Look forward. Look forward. I love that. Don't look sideways. Look forward. <laughs> and so as you were, have been looking forward with throughout your career, what do you feel was a couple of pivotal points that led you to this current president CEO seat? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I, all of my sort of work culminates, right. And the successes and the failures, and I've had a lot of both. And I would say that every sort of misstep has been met with a new opportunity or a new challenge. And so when I'm talking to people or mentoring them, one of the key things I always say is you cannot make a mistake. You cannot, like it's just gonna lead you to something else. And so, Mm. um, you know, my path, um, really starting in traditional advertising, moving into digital very, very early, um, was was really predicated on how I grew up. And mm. I am the daughter of an artist and a computer programmer. And mm. so that sort of <laughs> left brain, right brain, yeah. early, early days. I mean, my dad 
um, did early punch card programming in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Wow. A, a company that became ADP. It was called Cyphernetics. And, you know, he claims he invented email. We like to joke about it at dinner. <laughs> um, and, but he really believed that it, in order for us to play video games, we had to understood, understand how they had been constructed. And oh. so we learned early basic if then programming as mm -hmm. kids. And wow. the, the idea was really sort of ways in which technology is going to help us lean forward. And so, you know, technology, and then I have a love of creative and art and design yeah. and, and sort of the magic of typography and, and sort of early um, programming and de in design. So those two things together have kind of been um, facets of every job I've ever taken. And I would say in the one that I'm sitting in now, we have a little bit of both sides, right, of sort of the power of technology to make things better, which has been a constant in my, in my career, coupled with an understanding of messaging and people and sort of the, the art side of it, if you will, in terms of how to deliver messaging through these platforms yeah. that actually makes people do things. I love that. Wow. On the yeah. design side, just can I ask your advice? Um, should sure. we change our logo to Papyrus or Comic Sans? <laughs> <laughs> I always, you know what, honestly, Hobo. Just go Hobo. Go. <laughs> Every other letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, definitely the way to go. <laughs> yeah, cap, low cap. Yeah. Little, yeah. Little, little, your, your friend. <laughs> On a more serious note, how many employees are now at Shift Paradigm? Yep. So we have a little over 300. Um, okay. Wow. An acquisition we just uh, completed in uh, New oh, York. Oh, congrats. Yeah, Thank I was, you. I was reading about that. Is it pronounced ergo? Ergo? Um, okay, either okay. one. Um, I've always pronounced it ergo. Um, okay. And uh, by the end of the year, we will fully have transitioned um, all of the ergo people into Shift Paradigm. Okay. Um, okay. Will, will go away. And then, you know, 11 months-ish ago when you came into the org, how many employees were then? Uh, so we had about 230, I think at that point, 220, okay. 230. Um, so we've had a lot of growth um, and a yeah. lot of, frankly, just a lot of change. Um, you know, the, the company has experienced like pretty seismic um, turnover issues. And, you know, largely reflective of um, some acquisitions and changes that mm. happened the year before I got there. And then largely oh. um, just obviously based on a pretty chaotic uh, talent market, of course, that that yeah. is now changing again. As, as it is. Yeah. I mean, we had the great resignation, as they called it, and then just the shifting economy and everything else. Uh, and, and mergers and acquisitions is always tough. Um, oh. I sold my company at the end of 2020 and then. The company that bought us flipped us weeks later and just a nightmare. Um, so much turnover. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and, and, you know, as previous to this job, obviously I had done the sale process for Periscope uh, that mm. was bought by Quad, uh, you know, which is a printer in Wisconsin. And, you know, the, you know, catastrophic, catastrophic change. Yeah. And, you know, really taught me a lot about what I never hope to do again in an M and A <laughs> process as a seller yeah. or frankly, as a buyer, um, it was a real yeah. case study in, um, frankly, how to do it poorly. Wow. wow. Yeah. Okay. So you're coming into this new role, this company that's growing despite economic challenges. Yep. There's been acquisitions, there's been massive turnover. So you've had quite a few challenges. What are some other challenges that you feel like you faced coming in as CEO? Yep. So, when I joined in December, they had just relaunched the brand um, and sort of created the, the Shift Paradigm brand in November, of right before I joined. They had um, purchased a company called LeadMD out in Arizona. I had merged those companies together. They had done a reorg. And so when I got there, we were missing, we were missing a North Star. We were missing a mission, vision, values. Um, a real sort of gap in a number of places. So the first quarter for me was really about laying that groundwork, right? Mm -hmm. What's the mission? What's the vision? What are the values upon yeah. which we operate? 
I am not now a what person. Process, what yeah. process did you follow? Did you do like an EOS or anything like that? Or did you bring kind of your own thoughts and ideas for how to create all of that? Yeah, we didn't do EOS, although I've done that um, in a couple of companies um, that I've worked with and, and even on boards where they're a little smaller. EOS, I don't think would have been big enough for us. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we went through the process of uh, really reduction on the mission, vision, and values. Um, and I had just actually completed that same work at Bright Health Group. Mm. And so went through that same process where sort of interviews, keywords, draft statements, and then really the process of reduction, right, as you know, is the hardest um, part of any of that work because everybody, you sort of want to make it the, you know, the yeah. mission mishmash, right, of every sure. buzzword. Every um, idea, yeah. Every so idea and every, like, you know, I always actually say that if you can't credibly argue the other side, you don't have a point of view, right? <laughs> yeah. That's good. Like, well, so I have a challenge for you now because great. of what you just said, that this process <laughs> of reduction. I you're about to ask. Uh, I don't know if you do, but I was looking at your core values and uh, re we reflect and relearn. It's hard to say. And then we value different perspective. Those are super similar, but you went through a... a the grueling process. So what ultimately made those two stand out as separate core values that you had to keep separate? Well, you teed up my favorite question. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Um, but my, one of my guiding quotes for um, myself, but anywhere that I operate is from Alvin Toffler, right? So Alvin Toffler wrote Future Shock in 1972. In that book, he predicted the internet, which is unbelievable. And then in 1994, he wrote a book called The Third Wave, um, where he really predicted the rise of nationalism, terrorism, mm. like big, heady, heady concepts. Wow. Yeah. And one of his quotes is that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn mm. and relearn. Oh, man. That's fantastic. And how true. And, and I don't know that we've ever seen it in a society as we have in the last hundred percent. Yeah. A few years. Unlearning is the key to literacy yeah. and that that premise of we learn and relearn mm -hmm. is really that idea that if you approach something with, I know exactly what to do, you've already lost. Yep. Technology is changing. The world's changing. Now you bring your experience, of course, and you bring sort of your understanding or your sort of pattern recognition, if you will. But the, the ability to unlearn, the ability to, you know, we used to say it tribal, that our superpower was divergent thinking, convergent, divergent thinking, because when you're in a creative process, and you reach a point of convergence, something everybody can believe in, the hardest thing in the whole world to do is to introduce divergent thought. Mm -hmm. And that comes from unlearning. And so that you get from, you know, hey, you know, mothers love their kids. Like there's our core insight. True, inarguable, not an insight. And so unlearning actually is the discipline to be able to reach a point of convergence, which always feels good. And it always feels like you've moved this team, but to, to back away and say, what do we have to unlearn or unwind in order to go to that next level of depth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, really good. Uh, do you know Adam Grant? Do you read him at all? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Th Think Again was one of my favorite books of the last few years. Absolutely. Uh, all about unlearning, questioning your own assumptions, uh, shifting paradigm. Hey -oh. Absolutely. Hey -oh. <laughs> and we talk about shifts all the time, right? What are the yeah. shifts that we're making? And it, it really speaks again to, to that premise. So to your original question, that's the difference mm. versus bringing disparate groups of people together and making sure that you're surrounding problems with, yeah. with different people. And I'll tell you one other story that, um, and I'll probably get some of the details wrong, so I apologize in advance. But in like 1906, uh, there was a guy, and I'm going to forget his name, and 
kind of a yucky guy. He had some real promise. His uh, philosophies were all around how the, the noblemen were smarter than the common man. Oh. And he sort of had some eugenic stuff. But he ran an experiment in London in 1906. And the experiment was to guess the weight of an ox. And everybody that was there had some experience with livestock, but no sort of specialty, you know, knowledge, if you will. And the um, they had 25 noblemen guess, and then 800 people paid a small amount of money to guess, and so that they took it seriously and and sort of had some some real thought. When averaged, the 25 noblemen were off by about 200 pounds. When averaged, as the the common man, the 800 people, they were within a pound. Wow. wow. <laughs> and the, the takeaway is that groups of people can actually be really good at solving problems mm-hmm. because they bring different perspectives. You have enough sort of tension around a larger group that they can they can solve problems. So that premise of, you know, why diversity matters and, and equity and inclusion, there's, there's real sort of human truth behind that, that problems are solved more accurately and, you know, likely in more innovative and interesting ways when approached by groups, different groups of people. Yeah, absolutely. Really? Gosh, I love that. Right. Okay. So continuing the story, Q1, you, you, you're, um, you're building yep. the, the mission, vision, values. And, and I interrupted you, and I'm really glad we went down that rabbit hole. Uh, yep. But pick, pick back up there. Yep. So, you know, really laying the groundwork for the company, laying the, the pieces. Q2 uh, was really focused around solving what was unintentionally perhaps the most Byzantine organizational structure I've seen in quite some time. And I think because remember in 2021, these two companies had come together, um, big cultural differences, and they had created an org structure to sort of make everybody happy and resulting mm-hmm. the resulting org structure made nobody happy was very difficult to navigate um, and really just led to a lot of confusion in the organization about where do I fit? What's my job? I don't, I don't get it. And so we, we spent some pretty serious uh, intellectual time working through um, a much simpler org structure. And mm-hmm. the way I talked about it was org structures have to deliver three things. They have to make us easier to buy, right? That clients are like, yep, get it. They have to make our work better and they have to ultimately make us a great place to work. And if they don't serve any of those three things, we don't do it. We don't serve individuals' egos. We don't serve design org structures to meet, you know, weird, this person doesn't like this person or these two groups, they think their work is slightly different. We pulled all that off the table and designed an org structure that would allow us to to really move forward more clearly. So we executed that in July, uh, July 1, as a matter of fact, with um, a ton of work up in terms of communication and new teams and new job descriptions. And then Q3 um, and Q is really about fine tuning our sort of go to market sort of process and the way we think about how we're working, how we're communicating externally about what we do. Um, and I would say we've got some work there. If you've spent a little time on our website, it's still pretty confusing. Um, and, you know, Q4 is about, and again, into 2023, external, external, external. So I've spent quite a bit of time in Q3 with clients understanding how we're working, where we're providing value, where we're not, what we're not doing well, um, to make sure that, you know, we are a services organization. So we have to live and die by the clients that we serve. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so my focus has been, I mean, I've been on the road every single week since um, probably July. Um, Now you're traveling, meeting clients at their offices in person. You wow. got it. I and don't, how many existing clients do y'all have? 
We have a lot. I think we okay. have. <laughs> um, and again, it's a mix of sort of long-term big retainer clients. Okay. <laughs> and then we have project um, based clients as well. So we, we likely at any time have between 175 and 200 active. Okay. Clients. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, uh, you're going to be on the road for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I and, try to try to connect them up so that we're doing multiple things in in multiple weeks, or I'm yeah. um, seeing people in cities, or um, you know I'm going to be on the East Coast next week, and the idea is okay, go to Baltimore and then drive up or take a train up to Manhattan um, to get to see the Ergo team and some of their clients. Wow. Yeah. Well, are you are you seeing the impact of that? And I mean, if so, what are what are some of the most impactful things you've seen? in these conversations that you're having? Yep, a hundred percent. I mean, there's there's always impact. And, and you know, I think even we collectively have learned um, about the power of in-person. As much, you yeah. know, we were joking when I was in Austin earlier this week um, and we, a bunch of the teammates came into the office and we were joking that we should give everybody like, almost like a heads piece that has you in a frame like yeah. this <laughs> nice people um when you're only looking at them in, in a box but the you know the idea of seeing clients what that does is really it's helped me to understand sort of the macroeconomic forces sort of what's happening how are companies anticipating what is likely to be a, a tough economic year in 2023 how are they planning for that are they adjusting? What are they investing in now in anticipation of that? So it, it really does inform how we think about our product set, how we go to market and adjust even our own, our own marketing and, and product set in order to be able to meet the need. Yeah. So that's a lot of change. It's a lot of figuring things out that you're having to do uh, fresh in this role. Um, the vision, the values, the mission all came early on, uh, but there's still acquisitions, there's still all these other things going on. Uh, what, what are some of the challenges culture wise of getting those values and those everything else to like really permeate across the existing organization that was a merger of two and the new acquisition? Yeah. I mean, it, it is not an insignificant challenge. And then remember of the 300 people we have, we have no center of gravity. Mm -hmm. so when I was in Austin, which had typically been the center of gravity, um, where, where the original company was with, you know, acquisitions that were bolted onto it, we have 18 people within <laughs> drive, wow. and drivable. Wow. Things. Everybody's moved. Everybody's everywhere. So, so really remote. I mean, super remote, right? Yeah. So, you know, in addition to just the usual different companies coming together, learning new things. We have a lot of people that have never met anybody in person. Wow. Yeah. That's tough. It's, it's, it's a real challenge. I think um, the team, I give all credit to the team has done an incredible job on the values in particular. So uh, we use a software package called 155 uh, that does check-ins that you can mm. sort of monitor sort of how people are feeling inside of the company on a weekly basis. And one of the features that 15.5 has is high fives. Oh, yeah. Okay. And right, simple, people throw them up there. Um, but what we do on our um, biweekly company call, and all the high fives are tied to a value. People do a hashtag, which value this person has demonstrated, or and then fill the story out. During the all hands, um, we have the person that wrote it read it. For the okay. person oh, okay. there. And it's just a really beautiful way of, again, calling out and letting people thank one another. Um, I think sometimes when companies try to lean too hard, it can sort of feel like worst fun, right? Or like yeah. <laughs> mandatory fun. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. And, and to really watch the teams onboard it, you know, really embrace it, give thanks to one another, like that's the win. That's the win. That really is cool. Wow. So 15.5 software, that's been a, a help. W what else have you had to lean into? How else have you had to get creative for those values to permeate? 
Yep. So, you know, it's, it's repetition. So sort of to the, mm. to the top of the questions, right. Of what's the biggest mistake, um, really finding ways to, to repeat. So even on our shift change call, we'll often have a reset of here are the values here. And we just do one, maybe two at a time to just be able to say like, here are examples of things that are reflective of those values beyond high fives. And that allows people to like, okay, I can, I can see that because what I didn't want to do with the values. And again, you saw them in the, you know, lots of companies lean into table stakes, right? Sort of the idea of like, be kind, be kind. My hope is we're not hiring people that aren't kind sort of at their (laughs) core. So the hope is that when you read a set of values, that it makes your stomach clench a little bit. It makes you sort of have to really evaluate, can I meet this? Is there stretch in here? And that is when I think you get really interesting responses and you get interesting interpretations and frankly, just more, um, just sort of interesting adoption as opposed to sort of laying things out that are like sort of identifying you as a good person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, the core value integrity always drives me nuts. Cause it's like, I mean, are you hiring people that don't have that? Right. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Authenticity, yeah. like just words yeah. that are like, they seem too generic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I appreciate that. And the repetition is, is huge. And I, I, I felt as a leader, like it was ad nauseum. I mean, every single meeting, you know, quarterly meeting we'd have that was company wide, talking about the core values and doing the similar thing. Like, here's a story. Here's somebody who exemplified this. And it it took me a while to get used to that repetition because I felt like, gosh, the people don't want to hear this anymore. Right. But the reality is like some of them were hearing it for the first time, even though we had done it a dozen times. Uh, You find that to be true for you as well? Thousand percent. And we're mavericks, right? Like we've said it. So let's all move on. Like I'm bored. Like, (laughs) yeah, like I got it. It is not, it, it requires to your point, almost endless repetition. And that doesn't mean that people are slow to get it. It means people onboard it differently, or they need different sort of inputs in order to really internalize it. And that, that is hard, but probably, you know, if I think about the many mistakes I made at Periscope and the shift that I've made, see what I did there? Um, uh, what I really believed at Periscope was that it was my job to put the company on my shoulders and to physically walk it forward. Mm. And I had listened to executives talk about servant leadership and it sort of felt like, uh, 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 whatever, like, like you're just, it it felt soft, right? Yeah. And it, it did. It just felt like it's nice. That's nice. Mm. And now I understand that in a way that for whatever reason took the turmoil of Periscope for me to really understand it, but that really my job is to serve people inside of the organization and get things out of their way. Mm. And so when I look at this last year, it is a ton of change. It's been a ton of work. But largely the the headline has been get things out of people's way so they can do a good job. Not that I'm here to show everybody what a good job is. Everybody already knows. I just need to make sure if the organizational structure makes it hard for you to do, do great work, let me get that out of the way. Yeah. yeah I love that. Yeah. Because you're not talking about doing work for them. You're not talking about uh, getting work out of their way because it's been done. You're talking about the nonsense that just doesn't, shouldn't exist in the first place. hundred percent. And there's endless amounts of it, despite all <laughs> efforts. It's sort of, you know, you have kids and you think like, I'm never going to buy a million plastic toys. <laughs> and you, find, you find yourself with a basement of, you know, 70,000 yeah. pieces. And you're like, this it, unintentional, unintentional. Um, yep. But yeah. I recently moved and, uh, I just swore to myself, I'm not going to live out of boxes. And if I don't need it, I'm going to get rid of it. And the sheer insane volume of things that ended up on like the giveaway groups on Facebook or just in a trash bin somewhere. Unbelievable. 
and organizations are absolutely the same. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if it's okay, I'd like to take a little shift here. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about, and you mentioned it earlier, which I really loved, is hiring not for culture fit, but for more filling um, holes and, and gaps. And then we've talked about, of course, the, the remote work. So at, like with those two things in mind, do you, as you're looking towards 2023 and thinking of, of culture and the, the team being all spread out, do you all have plans of things to maybe, you know, a, a meeting where everyone comes together or, or, you know, what I'd love to hear kind of what what is your future plans when it comes to those things? Yep. So you are singing my song. <laughs> I met with our investors yesterday and this was a yesterday. Topic. Yes. I love it. Um, so when I joined, I said, we need a meeting to get everybody together. And we worked through this year. And as I've mentioned, we've executed a number of things and just, we couldn't find either a time or the sort of financial space to just lump that kind of expense on top of the organization when it wasn't planned for. And despite my best efforts, um, and the plan was originally to have it do it in Q3, we've pushed it um, so that we'll do it in the beginning of Q1. Um, and interestingly, you know, we've, we've grown well, we've continued to, to perform. But of course, investors always want more and they want you to grow faster and they want you to grow more profitably. And we haven't hit every metric there, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I said to the, the guys yesterday was, my hope was that we would start performing and then we'd be able to do that meeting. And what I'm now realizing is we need that meeting in order to uh, start performing. Yep. And that we've sort of limped along um, culturally with pockets of meetings and people together, but that the import of a collective, like we are shift and this is what this company means and the ability to, you know, hug your coworkers, um, is, is so critically important for our path forward. And, I felt it in the senior management team who I've gotten together monthly since, since I started, we started January 16th. in person, in person. Um, and I started a, a thing. I'm, I am a hugger by nature. I'm Midwestern. It's part of what we do. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had made a joke in our first meeting, you know, to, um, one member of our team who's not as much of a hugger. Um, I had said to him, come on, bring it in. Bring it in. <laughs> and that's now literally sort of our senior exec. Bring and like in. we can duke it out. We can argue. We can but at the end of the day, like we bring it in. Mm. Is this about that. five five to ten people? Yep. So um it's been as large as seven and um right now it's six. So yeah, okay. we're right on that that sort of yeah. core senior exec team. Um yeah. but again, being able to do that as a company, right? Like everybody bring it in. I love uh, Ken. Uh, I never pronounce his last name right, but I think it's Snowatake, um, who does the free hugs project. Mm. Uh, if you've ever looked into him. He's amazing. And that premise of, of the amount of serotonin and connection that yeah. comes um, as human beings from a simple hug to me is, is what we're missing still. Yeah. Well, anecdotally, if for what it's worth, um, I used to be able to do that same kind of a thing, an annual summit, because I had about 20 offices, about 200 kind of admin employees. We had 2,000 employees just you know, out kind of doing the work, uh, feet on the street, uh, but the admin people, about 200. And man, like the couple of few months following an annual summit where everyone was together, able to let loose, able to, were outrageously outperformed the rest of the months. And then the years when we couldn't do it for whatever reason, COVID was, you know, happened, things like that detrimental yeah. to the culture, you can feel it. productivity, profitability, everything else. Uh, yeah. Again, only anecdotal. It's only one person's experience, but sim it seems really similar. And I think that once yeah. you have that, you'll just have an explosion of productivity and profitability. I now, believe it. I believe it. Yesterday, did and you got the thumbs up. Hey, we're moving forward. We're planning this thing. 
Um, pretty close. What I got, okay, was, okay. we just see it in the entirety of the year. You know, if we're planning for a softer Q1, how does that shake? And um, sure, sure. and the original budget um, had been much higher. I said, look, I'll I'll look to do it in as inexpensive a way that I can um, in order to make it um, make it palatable. But it's mm -hmm. what I said was it's a non-negotiable to do. Oh, I love that. That is great. And, and it's tough. You know, you talk to investors and, and they look at the economy and even as a leader and you're obviously going to be budget conscious, but to sit there and say, we have to spend money to make money when everything around us is tightening up, our clients' budgets are tightening up, everything else, uh, but to have the conviction that this is a non-negotiable, uh, I love that. That's a very maverick thing to do, by the way. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Like this, I, it, like I said, I, I went the whole year wanting to do it, not doing it and waiting for that accelerant sort of point. And it's just so clear to me that that accelerant won't come without the investment. And it's just, it, we, by our nature, are herd animals, right? We're, we're animals and we need to be around other animals in order yeah, to, to belong, see the herd and, and feel the herd sort of in its entirety. And without it, you sort of, you're in this real false economy of, I think of, of what's happening and how the teams are operating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah right. and I, we've talked about a lot of things. I mean, our listeners are leaders that they're, they're people like us that are trying to do this every day. And we've obviously hit a lot of great nuggets. Um, but is there anything like that comes to mind that, as it relates to culture, building culture as a leader, that's profound that you like, okay, I have to say this on this podcast or, or I'll be remiss or you know, we covered I, most of it. Well, I think we've covered a lot of it. I, I think the piece that is probably most important is that as you get more sort of seasoned in your career, um, AKA old that, um, <laughs> You can find yourself getting increasingly calcified, right? Where you mm. think you've got the answers, you're, you know, sort of, you've always, you've seen it before, you know what's going to happen next. And I think the most important thing that leaders can do, and this is very Brene Brown, right, is, is sort of to stay open, stay. It's almost like you have to crack that calcification where you feel it. Um, and make sure that you, you stay open because it, and it's more painful to be open by the way. And oh, yeah. when you really invest in, invest in it and you stay open, it can break your heart. It can absolutely break your heart. And that whether it's, you leave something or someone determines you're not right for something that can leave you more vulnerable as a person. And yet what I would say is you're better for being open always. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and I, every time I hear something like that, I, the only story I can think of is when uh, I was working with my dad on some projects and he's very bullheaded, very kind of stereotypical boomer. And I was like, will you just read this? It's like the shortest book I can find that I know would have an impact. And he just says, Jason, I'm done learning new things. And I'm like, Oh my God, if I ever say that, just put me in the ground. <laughs> I just well, can't. Um, you know what? And to that point, if you go back to my Alvin Toffler quote, I had the exact same conversation with my dad, who's 81. Mm -hmm. And you know, every time a new iOS update comes in, right. He's like, Oh, <laughs> dang it. Like, they're going to move everything around. I'm not going to know where things are. And I said, dad, it's literacy. It's literacy. Change is literacy. And so the more you think of sort of literacy being at the base level of your participation in society, then that way you become you become more effective if you embrace it as opposed to reject it. Sure. That's really, really good. Uh, I, I heard the, the ding in the background. I'm assuming it's a calendar thing and we, uh, we want to make sure that... <laughs> Yeah, no, oh, I'm, no. I'm, oh, you're okay. No, that's fine. We, we, it, it's a good time cue. Um, so, so we'll move kind of the next segment. We've mentioned this Maverick word a few times. Um, and it's just funny that all three of us have that profile. Uh, so you, you took that assessment and we, we are actually a little bit different 
uh, in, in some key ways, but that's for different conversation over cocktails or something, but another day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what I find interesting looking at your profile in particular is that the two the kind of most spread out, uh, prominent kind of hard wiring motivators are your, um, extroversion, just that being that very empathetic verbal processing. Uh, and then the other is absolute lack of conformity rules are suggestions. They're for everybody else. Uh, making you very flexible. And, and that also is like your brake pedal, which you have none, which is why you're just like hundred miles an hour. So first of all, does that sound accurate? Secondly, if so, how does that play into you as a leader? I am in a hundred percent. I've like, like all of us, I've taken many, a psychological <laughs> assessment tool and they always yep. say the same thing, Yeah, which is good. So that means that they're consistent, they're consistent. <laughs> Um, yeah. and I, I think that is right. I think as I talked about sort of the need to have people around you and me that are, you know, the naysayers, the, the brake pedals, the, you know, while I hate it, the premise of a devil's advocate, mm -hmm. um, is a really good thing for somebody like me that, you know, I, am I don't conform well, I have always had issues with authority and, mm -hmm. you know, Really yeah. that, but that allows me what I believe is to see around corners. And so whether it's being able to see like something that's coming, you know, I started predicting the layoff and sort of the snapback in the talent market in February, because it was mm. pretty clear sort of where the next, the end of the year was going to come from a sort of overspend and a technical, these technology companies. But I think, but again, that comes from you know, not being good at lots of things that are more structured or more, um, thoughtful. Yeah. Follow through is probably not your favorite thing. Like it, the minutia. I'm yeah. I'm bad at it. And again, the best thing in the world is having a chief of staff who not mm. only is organized like that. She said, these are the three things, five things, eight things you need to get done. And I have a million systems, right. Of like, I love bullet journaling, I never get it all the way done, but I love the premise of it. Um, and so the, you know, but having somebody who's like, let's stay on task, get these things done is makes a world of a world of difference. Yeah. Yeah. They, they balance you out. Yep. I, man, I had a, a person with a very high brake pedal as my COO. And at first we just butt heads, you know, he thought I was a wild card. I thought he was a stick in the mud. Yeah. Uh, and when we finally got language, so to, spot on. Yeah, yeah. Like when we finally got the language to say, Oh no, actually we can balance each other out really well. I can move us forward. You can slow us down and make sure we're not making massive mistakes. Huge, 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 uh, to success when you're in a leader to surround yourself with people that balance you out, uh, as frustrating as those people can sometimes be. <laughs> Absolutely. And how frustrating I'm sure I can be to work with. And I try to, oh, yeah. Um, really lead with both accountability and also openness. Like if there are people on my team who I try to really check in with authenticity to say, am I driving you crazy? Like, mm -hmm. please know that my intent is I don't wake up in the morning and thinking, I'm not thinking about how to drive you crazy, but I recognize <laughs> that some of my tendencies are absolutely that. Sure. And so I also try to adjust or dial back where, you know, again, I, I want, the, my team and the people that I'm working with to also be able to be in their best selves. And so if I'm doing things that prevent that, like I, I am aware enough to try to yeah. pull those back. Well, that's, that's an impressive self-awareness. It is. Yeah. And we talk about self-awareness a lot on the podcast also with, with what we do for work. And, um, we talk about it. It's not just knowing the behavior, it's understanding how that behavior affects the people around you. Uh, and it sounds like you definitely taking a lot of time to understand both of those aspects. I, I've tried. I've certainly done my share of um, sort of leadership classes. Certainly when I left Periscope, mm. I did a really intense leadership program to really just unwind, you know, what is at that core? What are the stories you tell yourself? What are mm. the, the, the things you do? And one of the most powerful phrases that came out of that for me was the premise of my experience of you is. And oh, I like that. It's a bit of 
you know, it, it gives you a framework to have a difficult conversation and or to hear a difficult conversation mm. that isn't quite as judgmental or you are a or, you know, you always do this. It's mm. just my experience of you is this. Wow. Yeah, it probably is still difficult to hear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is a different way to just like the story I'm telling myself is it's a different way to, to enter into that conflict. I like that a lot. That's right. Now, if it's okay, this is not a, a question I've asked before, but as I was laying in bed last night thinking, because the first question we asked you, we, we've we asked everyone, but then I was thinking, I was like, I, I'm curious to know kind of on the opposite. As you scan back throughout your career, mm-hmm. what is that there's bound to be one or maybe multiple moments that you think of that are like, oh, I am so proud of that thing that we did surrounding, you know, mostly surrounding culture and, and, and your love for people. But can you think of a moment uh, that I see you nodding there? So I'd love to, to hear yeah. more. Yeah. You know, I think so at tribal DDB, I had joined uh, in 2004 and we were this tiny little sort of digital division of DDB, one of the world's most powerful creative agencies. And we were really the kids under the stairs is the way I would describe it. And I joined in San Francisco. It was me and one other guy. And wow. um, the Clorox was the account we were working on. And unbeknownst to me, Clorox had actually given Tribal 30 days notice um, to basically like fix it or they were gone. Um, everybody wow. had forgotten to, to tell me that, which is probably <laughs> just as well because I dove in head first. And, you know, we built a pretty amazing office and then subsequently a pretty amazing company really on this premise that we were going to change the world. And we officed in a single conference room. It's my favorite office of all time. We all sat around a huge conference room table together. And actually one of the women that worked for me at tribal San Francisco now works for me again today at shift. Um, And (laughs) What we built was this just incredible culture of sort of connectedness and willingness to do anything and lean in. And I'll never forget, I was getting, I was at the time was running Tribal West. So that included Dallas, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And there was an opportunity to take over um, the U.S. and have my counterpart take over globally. And I remember saying to my boss at the time, Matt Freeman, one of my all-time um, favorite people on the planet, um, I said, I'm not sure I can do it. I'm not sure. And he said, the fact that you're reluctant means that you're ready. Mm. And to me, that was such a, I've given that advice to many people that if you are reluctant, it means you're ready because that's the right time to go, not when you feel like you've, you're ready or you're already past it. And oh. so I think I'm most proud of that, but I will tell you that at this time of year, um, we just launched this actually for Shift. Um, we've done something called Greatness and Gratitude. And the idea is to give everybody a space where they can talk about in November, the thing they've worked on this year that they're most proud of. And the framework I always use is, what are you going to tell your parents about at Thanksgiving dinner? And for me, I love that. That's so good. Rounding is a really good cultural touchstone. Okay. Yeah, that is so good. Thanks for sharing, Liz. That's good. Yeah. (laughs) That's good stuff. Uh, Doing a time check, we probably should uh, wrap up and let you get back to your day. Is there anything that you want to plug for the audience? Well, thank you. Um, We are at a number of different events um, this year. I'd love to meet other leaders. Um, People are welcome to to reach out to me on LinkedIn. um, If again, we can be of service, but also I'm really just, you know, I love to network and be connected. So uh, I think check out our website. It's getting better and uh, we've got some work to do, but um, nothing specific to plug. I, I really just enjoy being connected to other leaders. Yeah. Awesome. Liz Ross and shift paradigm.com. Correct. You got it. All right. We get it. We're going to end off with a little bit of silly. It's just a quick fire. I'm going to say two things. You got to choose which one. Okay. Yeah. First one, 
uh, fonts, serif or sans serif? <laughs> serif, always. <laughs> Mac or PC? Mac. Okay. Bus or train? Train. Fast food restaurant or sit down restaurant? Sit down restaurant. All right. Let's see. Just one more. Coffee or tea? Not even a question. Coffee. Always coffee. coffee. I was going to make a joke and say Michigan or Michigan State, but I'm not going to make that joke. <laughs> and you know, you know exactly where I'd go despite our terrible football performance. We have basketball <laughs> coming up, but it's I MSU love it. all the way. I love it. Uh, Liz, this has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Really enjoyed it. So many great nuggets that we got from you. Thank you so much for your time, for coming on the show. And definitely would love, um, I, either of us, both of us would love to be able to connect over maybe a glass of wine or a beverage next time you're in Austin, for sure. Love it. I'm down there quite a bit, so I look forward to that. Awesome. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Liz. Hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. Work Bye -bye. Culture Podcast, signing off.